This is what I say to you. Welcome to my edge of view. Hey guys, short video tonight because it's night and I'm tired and I don't need a reason. Get off my back! Today's story comes to my attention thanks to the ever-reliable BBC and takes us to good old Philly, Pennsylvania. Once home of both of my parents and now home to Monsignor William Lynn, the most senior clergyman directly connected to the Catholic Church's little kitty-tickling scandal that the media has been so right to shame them for these last few months and years. If you haven't heard of this Monsignor Lynn guy, don't worry, he's news to me too. But from what I've read on him, I'd like to think of him as a bit like Joe Paterno. He didn't actually sexually abuse anyone himself, but he sure as hell didn't stop his direct underlings from doing it when he was clearly had the knowledge, power, and opportunity to do so at many different stages in the child abusing process. Those direct underlings, by the way, were Edward Avery and James Brennan. Avery was a priest convicted more than a decade ago in 1999 for sexual assault. Problem was, Avery had already sexually assaulted another kid in 1994, but was allowed to switch over to another parish, a move that Monsignor Lynn allowed and supported even being fully aware of Avery's history as a child abuser. Brennan's case was similar, though less public because of minimal exposure. However, in some ways, his crime was worse than Avery's. After becoming friends with the family of the victim and gaining status of an uncle to the boy, he ended up committing acts against the kid that left him quote-unquote terrified and forever traumatized. Monsignor Lynn was at least aware of the possibility that Brennan's libido might lead to such an event, but he was left in the parish and nothing was done. Both of these crimes could have been avoided if the Monsignor had done anything, anything at all, to stop them. But he didn't do anything about it, and he was therefore rightly convicted and sentenced to three to six years in prison, which frankly doesn't seem like quite enough to me. I'm also a little thrown by the weird lack of media attention that this conviction and sentencing is getting, given that the entire country went apeshit on Sandusky, but you actually have to do some digging on most news sites to find even tidbits of the information that I just rattle off to y'all. As of this point, CNN has an article that was quickly pushed to the back of the page, Fox's article sugarcoats the atrocity by interjecting the good works done by Lynn at every third sentence. BBC's article is at least clear and accessible, but its information is sparse and very short. In fact, that last bit applies to all of the groups covering the story. None of the stories were longer than about a page. Meanwhile, Sherman Hemsley of the Jeffersons died today, and CNN gave him three articles and two videos, all longer than the article on Lynn's sentencing. While Fox was too busy freaking out about Syria so hard that this story slipped off the page, faster than an F-bomb off the lips of Bristol Palin's kid, or so reports CNN. Plus, these stories have stayed on the front page for a good few hours each at least, whereas only BBC had the Monsignor Lynn story on for any visible part of the site for any significant length of time. And you know why some stories stay visible and some don't? One word. Popularity. People don't bother reading it when they see it, so... Poof! Gone forever out of public consciousness. Why is this being hidden? Why is there this attempt to continue the very cover-up that got Lynn in trouble in the first place? It's apparently not a partisan thing or a network thing. If BBC and Al Jazeera are to be believed, then it's not really a national thing either. Al Jazeera's article on the subject was equally concise and hard to locate without knowing about the issue already. So what is it about these stories that bores us into letting them slip into obscurity and, by their obscurity, a form of acceptability? In short, why did we care more when Paterno did it? Part of the answer could be that after so many years of the scandal, it's old news and no longer interesting or shocking to us. South Park has parodied it, there are hundreds of jokes about it, and it just isn't as fresh as it used to be. We expect that the Catholic Church will have some corruption in it, so when it happens, we write it off as that wacky church just sexually abusing more of those gang than little choir boys. The Church, to its credit, has done a fantastic job of damage control, making this sexual abuse issue, now spanning over 500 reports worldwide, out to be just an anomaly, and in no way related to the Church itself or the patriarchal power structure established within it. Speaking of choir voice, that's another thing to think about. I think there's something in the American psyche that's developed over time that says that choir boys somehow just are victims of sexual abuse, whereas our big, strong athletes couldn't possibly be the victims of such an intimate crime. They're athletes! They're the ones we look up to to throw a ball into the end field and score an out goal or hit the racket with the ball into the four square or whatever it is athletes do. More on athletics in Friday's Olympics pre-analysis. Point is, when an athlete gets sexually abused, it's unexpected. When a choir boy gets sexually abused, we think we saw it coming. And that's a dangerous train of thought. So what do we do about this? How can we stand up and make these crimes more public? The first thing to do is go to CNN, go to Fox, go to BBC and Al Jazeera and read these articles. Understand the issues at hand and how things got this way. Don't be another person who just lets the rigmarole of yet another church abuse case stop you from knowing exactly what happened. Two, realize the breadth of the issue. 
We're not talking one or five or ten or even fifty cases of sexual abuse here. We're talking many hundreds of reported cases. Just the reported ones. Consider for a second that maybe, and I'm not saying it is, but maybe it's a systemic issue. That something about the people who function within the Catholic Church is connected to the sexual abuse and the allowance of sexual abuse by superiors like Monsignor Lynn. Lastly, keep in mind that although you can backtrace some of this evil to the institution, that does not mean that the institution means for it to. Not all priests are sex offenders, goddammit. I don't care what South Park or CNN says. There are many good Catholics and people working within the Catholic Church. I'm just saying that there are also some really fucking awful ones. Ones that rape children in the night. They are correlated, not causated, and I'm not trying to infer that they are. Wait a minute. Penn State and Lynn's Parish are both in Pennsylvania. What the hell is it with Pennsylvania and resolve sexual abuse cases this year? I mean, I know that Philly is called the city of brotherly love, but I think they're taking it a bit too far. Now that would be an interesting case of cause and effect. Anyway, agree or disagree, post your comments, love letters, and hate mail below. This was Spencer, and this was my Edge of View.